It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. Hello to everybody in the audience. Thank you for being here with me. In episode 99, I discussed that there is no explicit contradiction between these two statements. One, the existence of an all-good, all-powerful God. And two, the existence of evil. This is true simply because one is not the direct opposite of the other. So if the atheists thinks there is some hidden implicit contradiction between them, he must be making some hidden assumptions that would serve to bring out the contradiction and make it explicit. So the question then becomes, what are those hidden assumptions? I have assumed no atheist had ever addressed the problem of hidden assumptions other than in the typical atheistic argument I discussed in episodes 68 to 71 and in episode 99. But then I discovered that J.L. Mackey attempted to supply the hidden assumptions in the article entitled Evil and Omnipotence in the journal Mind in 1955. Mackey suggests the needed additions are that good is opposed to evil in such a way that a good thing always eliminates evil as far as it can, and that there are no limits to what an omnipotent thing can do. I follow his suggestion and list what must be Mackey's argument. I extend the numbering beyond those of that prior argument I gave in episode 99. Premise 5. An all-good, all-powerful God exists. Premise 6. Evil exists. Premise 7. A good being always eliminates evil as far as it can. Premise 8. There are no limits to what an omnipotent being can do. Much of the comments I give now regarding Mackey's argument basically come from the book Stand Firm by Paul M. Gould, Travis Dickinson, and R. Keith Lofton. In order to understand my comments on Mackey's attempt to supply the hidden assumptions, allow me to digress temporarily to inform you of the concept of necessary truths. Rene Descartes formulated the concept of necessary truth such that a statement is necessarily true if it is logically impossible to de deny it that is, to believe it to be false. Note that what is required is logical impossibility, not physical or psychological impossibility. For example, a bachelor is an unmarried male is necessarily true by virtue of the meaning of the word bachelor. So a necessary truth means it is logically impossible to be anything other than true. As long as Mackey's premises 7 and 8 are necessarily true, it seems we have discovered an inconsistent set of contradictory statements. For the conjunction of 5 and 7 and 8 renders 6 the reality of evil in the world, impossible. The result for the believer in God, this would be K 
catastrophic, leaving the option of either denying the obvious truth of premise six, the reality of evil, or surrendering our commitment to premise five, that an all good, all powerful God exists. In his article, Mackey says the situation for the theist is, quote, positively irrational. In terms of the problem of evil, an important distinction is often made between a defense and a theodicy. A theodicy is a branch of philosophy that deals with the issue of evil in the light of the existence of an all-good, all-powerful God. Its goal is to give a plausible a reasonable explanation as to why God permits evil. A defense, by contrast, is only intended as a possible explanation as to why God permits evil. But here is the crux of the problem with Mackey's suggestion. Neither seven nor eight is necessarily true. And thus his logical problem of evil fails. As Alvin Plantinga points out in his free will defense, seven is not necessarily true since a holy good being might have a morally sufficient reason to permit evil to occur. Further, eight is not necessarily true because then we would have to make the conclusion that the reality of human freedom might make it impossible for God to bring about a world as morally good as this present world without the presence of evil. I label this last statement as Statement 9. As Plantinga puts it, quotes, a world containing creatures who are sometimes significantly free and freely perform more good than evil actions is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, he must create creatures capable of moral evil. And he cannot leave these creatures free to perform evil and at the same time prevent them from doing so. God did, in fact, create significantly free creatures. But some of them went wrong in the exercise of that freedom. This is the source of moral evil. The fact that these creatures sometimes goes wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotent nor against his goodness. For he could have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by ending the possibility of moral good. End quotes. Plantinga's work means the prospect of proving a logical incompatibility between the reality of an all-good and all-powerful God's existence and the reality of evil's existence is significantly diminished, if not entirely hopeless. Before setting aside the logical argument and calling it settled, let's examine J.L. Mackey's and the atheistic philosopher Alex Rosenberg's popular objection to Plantinga's free will defense. They ask, couldn't God create free but morally perfect individuals? Individuals who would always freely choose the good? In other words, couldn't God create a robotic world that could only choose good? But Mackey's and Rosenberg's objection is totally misguided. First, because of their erroneous idea of evil. Second, because of their erroneous assumption that God could create something different from him that is perfect. Third, that imposing the limitation on humans so that they always must choose good is contrary to the idea of free will. And fourth, erroneously assuming that God can create any conceivable world, 
no matter how illogical. How do we define evil and its relationship to goodness is crucially important here. Mackey and Rosenberg, along with many other critics of theism, interpret God being, quote, all good, in quotes, to mean never allowing any evil. But there are two problems with this demand that God disallow evil. The first problem is logical. The second is personal. First, consider the logical problem of disallowing evil. If God is perfect, then anything different from him in any way is no longer perfect. You cannot change anything that is absolutely and completely perfect and still have it remain absolutely and completely perfect. That means that anything that God creates is, by definition, different from him and must itself be less than perfect. There are four possible types of worlds that God could have created. One, no world at all. Two, a robotic world where everyone must choose good. Three, an amoral world where there is no such thing as good and evil. And four, a moral world with free will where love is possible, but also hate, where pleasure is possible, but also pain, where good is possible, but also suffering and evil. Given these four possible worlds, I think almost all people would opt in favor of the last one. Interpreting evil as a privation from God's goodness this reduces the possibilities to the first two of the four types of worlds God can create in order to completely and totally avoid evil of any kind. That is, the two possibilities are no world at all or a robotic world where everyone must choose good. In other words, Mackey is demanding that God in his creative activity not to allow any deviation that will lead to evil. But that makes a mockery of every other emotion, goal, ideal, benefit, and dreams that critics of God want to maintain. In short, a universe logically incapable of evil is also one logically incapable of love, sympathy, nobility, graciousness, self-sacrifice, and success. A being unable to experience evil is also incapable of ex exhibiting mercy, compassion, or love. There can be no love given in a robotic, choiceless creation. Moreover, I don't see how, if humans must always choose good, that can be done freely. It is not hard to see how if God had created things with this limitation, creation would be nothing more than a pointless use of God's power. So what do we conclude here? For God to preclude even the possibility of evil, he must either not create anything at all or create something utterly pointless. Logically, it stands to reason that God allows the potential for evil because such e freedom is intrinsically equivalent to allowing the potential for nobility and virtue. Without that potential of evil, no love or other potentially good things can actually occur. Now let us consider the personal problem with demanding that God disallow evil. Once a person accepts the idea that evil has to be possible in order for us to have a meaningful free will, the next step is often to criticize God for allowing too much evil or the wrong kind of evil. As before, definitions and personal preferences are key. Critics of God often make another assumption at this stage, 
They make statements such as, quote, a good God might allow some evil, but he would never allow the X kind of evil, end quote. But then this assumes irrationally that there cannot be things worse than X. It is conceivable, is it not? that there are worse things than X that God has already prevented. And because he has prevented them, we are completely in the dark that they are even possible. We may complain that God allows certain kinds of evil. But theodicy is not a question of making God agree with our standards. We cannot say logically that if God does not act according to our moral preferences, then he himself cannot exist in moral perfection. What that claim would do is instead make the critic of God the ultimate standard of morality. To put this scenario in another light, claiming God cannot exist or cannot be perfectly moral unless he agrees with my moral preferences is to say, quote, I am morally perfect. So if God and I differ on some moral issue, then it is because God is wrong and I am not, In quotes. A person is not logically prevented from making this claim, but just because it is a possible viewpoint does not make it a reasonable one. Does this mean there could never be a circumstance where God's supposedly morality conflicts with what we see in our experience? No, not at all. The problem for the critic is that many of the rules the critic says that God fails to live up to is simply fictional. God never promises to make everyone's life easier or better, nor does he promise to alter cause and effect simply at our whims. Let me briefly say that God cannot create any conceivable world. God cannot create a world that contains logically incoherent things. For instance, God cannot create a world with married bachelors. If people have free will, it seems to me that they may refuse to cooperate with God. Thus, there are many worlds that God cannot create because people in them wouldn't comply with God's desires. In fact, we have already said that it is possible that there are no worlds with free but morally perfect individuals, and the free but perfect objection fails. Let me say that the de defense of God in the context of evil is to say that there are situations where it is possible that both premises five and six may exist together. From the conclusion I labeled as nine, we can say ten. Every free person created by God could misuse their free will on at least one occasion and do some wrong thing, no matter which world or what circumstances they were placed in. Why is that? Because if a human never misused his free will, then he would be morally perfect. That cannot be since a human is different from God and therefore, as I have said, cannot be perfect. This conclusion may be highly implausible or even false, but it is logically possible. If that is possible, then this follows. 11. It is not possible within God's power to create a world containing moral good, but no moral evil. In other words, it is possible that any world created by God that contains some moral good will also contain some moral evil. Therefore, it is possible for both five and six to be true together. In his book, On Guard, page 157, William Lane Craig wrote, 
I'm very pleased to report that after centuries of discussion, the books on the logical version of the problem of suffering have been closed. It's widely admitted by both atheist and Christian philosophers alike that the logical version of the problem of suffering has failed. The burden of proof it lays on the atheist's shoulders, namely trying to show that the coexistence of God and suffering is impossible, is just too heavy a burden to bear. Let me close this episode by reminding you, walk with God. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith, with Joe Mott.